Well, the setting for our passage today from Luke 5 is the town of Capernaum, to which Jesus had returned after travelling elsewhere. You may have gathered by now that Capernaum was a town on the Sea of Galilee. And in verse 1 of our passage, that sea is called the Lake of Gennesaret. That's not uncommon, is it? You know, like Sydney Harbour is also called Port Jackson. You know, you have multiple names for things, the Sea of Tiberias, lots of names for the same place. But here Luke refers to it as the Sea of, of sorry, the Lake sorry, of Gennesaret. Now this is a freshwater lake, equivalent in size around about to our Great Lake here in Tasmania. So that gives you an idea of the, the scale. And it was a lake which had an abundance of fish in it and it supported a whole industry of fishing and the town of Capernaum was in, its, in essence a fishing village, a fishing town. Anyone was allowed to freely fish on the lake and in our passage today we again meet a fisherman called Simon. Now Luke, the author of this account, introduced us to Simon in chapter 4. Jesus had gone into Simon's house and miraculously healed his mother-in-law. And we read in verses 1 to 3 of our passage in Luke 5, which I think will be on the screen, thank you. It says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So the situation, friends, is that following on from what we've learned in chapter 4, Jesus' popularity as a preacher and a teacher has not only continued, but it's grown. That is why in verse 1 we find the people crowding around him, pressing upon him. And it tells us that unlike what happens at other times, it was not for his miracles and his healings that uh, they were pressing upon him. It was so that they could listen to the word of God. Now this may mean, of course, either they were eager to hear the word which told them about God, or they were eager to hear the word which came from God. Either way, when they listened to Jesus, they got both, didn't they? They got a word about God that was coming directly from God. And it may have been that the people were crowding in a little bit too much on Jesus, so that, as we might say today, they were you know, invading his personal space. Or it may have been that, you know, because of the, the press of people, that his voice was simply not carrying sufficiently, and he needed a better spot to speak from, so that everyone in the crowd could hear him properly. So he notices two fishing boats sitting next to the shore and he thinks that he could use one of them as a pulpit. Now, these boats, just to give you an idea, that I, I read in the, you know, the background history books that they're about 27 feet long or about 8 metres. So they're bigger than the boat your uncle took you out on on your holidays as a child but smaller than modern commercial fishing vessels. And as verse 2 says, they, they were sitting there and the fishermen uh, who had the boats, they were washing their nets. So most likely this is morning time, as the fishermen had fished through the night and their shift was done. So they were washing their nets so as to maintain them for long-term use. Then as far as we can tell from verse 3, Jesus just goes and jumps into one of the boats. It happens to be the one that belongs to this fellow Simon. And he stands there and he asks Simon to push him out from the shore a little. Evidently Simon did this without any fuss. Simon certainly knew who Jesus was, having had him in his house previously. So Simon obliges the request. And at the end of verse 3, uh, we learn that Jesus then sat down in the boat. And at that uh, time in history, it was customary for a teacher or a preacher, not, not to stand as I am today, but a, a teacher would sit to teach his students or a crowd. Now that sets the scene for us friends. But it is the fascinating events which follow this which we're going to look at this morning. And we shall see together just one main point from our sermon, uh, from our passage today. One point. We're going to see that Simon Peter goes from seeing Jesus as master to seeing him as Lord. All right? So he, see, he initially sees Jesus as master, but by the end of our passage, he sees him as Lord. 
In verse 4 of Luke 5, it says this. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Jesus has taught the crowd. I think it is fair to say, you know, what was he teaching them? He would have been preaching the kingdom of God just as he said he would in earlier parts of Luke. And whether or not the crowd are still hanging around or if they've all gone home by this point, we're not told because the focus now is on what goes on between Jesus and Simon. Jesus is telling Simon to go out further into the lake where the water's deeper and let the nets down into the water again so that they can catch some fish. And what is Simon's response? In verse 5, he answers Jesus, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, I, I reckon, this is my take on it, I reckon there's a, a touch of annoyance in Simon's voice there. Now, we have to bear in mind that Jesus' trade, you know, his job, he was raised to be a carpenter. What would he know about fishing? Now, I'm sure most of us, particularly if you've you know, got a little bit of grey hair, most of us have experienced this sort of stuff in our lives. You know your job well, you know your trade or your profession, your occupation well, but from time to time you have to put up with somebody who boorishly throws their opinions around and even arrogantly tells you what they think is best for you to do in your role or even what you should be doing. School teachers get it all the time. What you teachers should be doing you know, is this. Nurses, doctors, I can tell you pharmacists hear it all the time. They get people telling them what and how things should be done. Simon is a fisherman and he knows all the tricks for getting a good catch of fish. And Simon knows this lake well. He knows his trade and he's in familiar territory. He and his partners, it refers to his partners, this of course means business partners. Um, so Simon you know, is unlikely to be a beginner, he's quite experienced at this if he's got partners in business. Okay, they'd been fishing all night long and they had nothing to show for all that hard night's work. There was no catch, and for that day, there'll be no money coming in from the sale of their fish. And so he would have been at least a little bit annoyed that a carpenter should come along and tell him what to do. We've caught nothing, and we know what we're doing. You cannot net fish in the daytime, is perhaps what he'll be thinking. But something twigs in Simon's mind, doesn't it? Keep in mind that he'd heard Jesus teach, so he knew that Jesus taught with authority, and he'd witnessed Jesus miraculously heal his own mother-in-law before this. So he knows that Jesus is something special. He knows that even if Jesus seems to be out of his element by telling him to let down the nets again, that it is worth listening to him. And so he obeys. He obeys at Jesus' word. He obeys because it is Jesus who says to do it, he obey, and he does so because he sees Jesus as being just what he calls him there in verse 5, master. Now, when we read that word master in Luke's gospel, it always means just a general title, all right, general title of authority. So Simon may not agree with Jesus, but he'll do as Jesus says because he is the master and, and therefore he should be you know, reverently obeyed and, and listened to and obeyed. And that happens in life in general, doesn't it? Each of us has met at least someone in our lives who commands respect and inspires confidence and whose word carries authority. For some of us, especially if we're the younger members here, for some of us it's our mum and dad. For others, it is a teacher at school that we revere or that we revered, or it might be your boss at work, or it might be a senior person even at this church. And in the case of Simon, what he has seen Jesus do in healing his wife's mother and what he's heard Jesus say in his teaching has led him to know that Jesus is the master, worthy of listening to and obeying. But friends, that's nothing necessarily special, is it? You know, as I've pointed out already, each of us has someone in our life who's like that. And if Jesus is merely the master, does that really distinguish him? from any other Jewish rabbi at the time? Or does it, in today, does it really distinguish him from the Buddha or Muhammad or, or, or a guru that we might like? 
Well, Simon's obedience pays a generous dividend. Let's look quickly at verse 6 and 7. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, whether or not Jesus had special knowledge of where all the fish were, or if he summoned the fish to swim en masse into the net, it doesn't really matter, does it? Jesus said to let the nets down, and against all the odds, against all of what would be expected in the circumstances, there is an amazing catch of fish. These guys had been fishing for years and would have never had such a draft of fish that not only did their nets tear, but the catch was so heavy that both of the two boats that they used to share the load started to sink as they headed into the shore. I reckon they would have seen nothing like it in all their years. And the bit that we're really concerned with, friends, here is what occurs in verses 8 and 9. Let's take a look at these verses to find out what effects <clears throat> all this has had on the owner of one of those boats. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch that they had taken. Luke at this point goes from calling him Simon to calling him Simon Peter and after this simply refers to him as Peter. So we'll call him either Simon or Peter or Simon Peter in our talk today. Same guy, friends, no matter what we call him. As verse 9 says, it is the great catch of fish which astonishes Simon Peter and the other fishermen. And Simon Peter is so affected by it that he falls down before Jesus and pleads, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I like how Jesus meets people where they are at. Simon Peter had heard him preach. That certainly would have made an impression upon him. He knew the authority with which Jesus taught. He had no doubt either seen or heard about Jesus casting out devils and demons. So Simon Peter knew that Jesus had authority over the forces of darkness. He had seen Jesus heal his mother-in-law in his own house. So he knew that Jesus had power over illness and death. Perhaps all of those things served as a way of preparing Simon Peter for what happens here with the great catch of fish. Because it is only when, de uh, when Jesus demonstrates his authority over nature and the order of creation that Simon Peter comes to appreciate just who Jesus is. It may have been that was the way Simon Peter's mind worked. He was a man who spent his days and, you know, as a fisherman, his nights out in nature, and he knew the laws of nature and how they could not be challenged or changed. But along comes Jesus Christ and turns all of that on its head. Catch fish where there are no fish, Simon. Catch fish in the daytime when those fish would otherwise see the net and swim away. And this speaks to Simon Peter more loudly and clearly than anything else Jesus had done up until now. And he is knocked over and he realises that he is in the presence of heavenly greatness. Do you notice that Simon Peter is not actually happy about the great haul of fish? He's not rejoicing that they can pay their bills for the day or have that little bit extra for the kitty? Instead, he is fundamentally changed. He is behaving as a man who realises that he is in the immediate presence of the Holy God. And even though the word he uses there for Lord could mean anyone in authority, not just the God of Israel, it is used for God in lots of other places in the Bible. And Simon Peter clearly means that Jesus is the Lord because of what he says with it, all right? He clearly means that Jesus is the Lord because of what he says alongside it. That's why we read from Isaiah chapter 6 this morning, because we have echoes from Isaiah 6 in what happens to Peter here. Isaiah, verse 5, as he's standing before the throne of God in his vision, he says, Woe to me, 
I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. We see echoes of that, don't we, in what Peter is experiencing here. Lord, it might remind us, friends, of Abraham when he spoke with the Lord in Genesis 18. Then Abraham spoke up again, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. Or it might remind us of that famous man, Job, a man who suffered much when the Lord corrects him. Job 42, and he says that he has now seen God. He says, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Simon has the same reaction. Before now, he called Jesus master. The master must be obeyed. But now everything has changed. And he now calls Jesus Lord. Simon Peter was up until now ready to obey, but now he is in agony at his sinfulness in the presence of the Holy Lord. Now, some people will say that Simon Peter was trying to hide or run from Jesus. But he does not really do any of that, does he? He is in awe and fear and he pleads with Jesus to depart. He knows that he is a sinner and cannot survive in the presence of the Lord. He knows that he cannot stand up to the searching of his own heart that must happen when he's in the immediate presence of God. And friends, even though what we're reading here is the history of Simon Peter's conversion all those years ago, the passage also demands that we stop and ask ourselves a question. That question is, do we know Jesus so that we know that he is the Lord? You have to stop and ask where Simon Peter would have been if he had continued to regard Jesus simply as the master. He would have gone on as a listener and as an observer and and maybe even as a great appreciator of Jesus and his words and his miracles. But that would have done nothing, would it? Would have done nothing to bring Simon Peter into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it can be with us today. And this is not here talking only about you know people that you meet on the street who have a limited idea or exposure to Jesus this is talking about people in the church this is talking about people who have been to church a thousand times and heard a thousand sermons who have gone to bible study and who have read their bible every night and if that has been all done by you friend and the most that Jesus is to you is the master who is worth listening to or the wise teacher who somehow challenges you and makes you expand your limits, or who can do amazing things worth spinning tales about, then you have not really come to know Jesus. Certainly not in the way that Peter did. If you think you come to Jesus to be affirmed in yourself and to be fulfilled because he is the master, then you certainly do not know Jesus, not in the way that Peter did. If Jesus has even healed you or healed a loved one or done some other great thing and you have not been bowed by the holiness of his presence, then you certainly do not know Jesus. Certainly not in the way that Simon Peter did. You know Jesus when you realise that you are undone in his presence. You know Jesus Christ when you look at him and then look at yourself And say in your heart something like, depart from me, for I am a sinner, O Lord. Now, we need to be careful. This is not prescribing that you have to have a certain experience. This is certainly not prescribing that you need to have a literal fall-down moment like Peter did here, Simon Peter did here, or that you have to say these words as some sort of formula. No one is telling you that today. But what we can take away from this, friend, is that each of us must have a stark awareness of the reality of the majesty and the power and the authority and the holiness of Jesus Christ and hold that against our own sinfulness, our own weakness, our own helplessness. And that is, of course, the only way in which we can be saved from being weak and sinful and helpless. 
Simon Peter saw Jesus as having all the power over the elements and over the natural order, and he knew that Christ was the Lord. He knew that Christ therefore had power over him. And for any of us, we need to be acutely aware that if we come to Jesus to be affirmed or to be confirmed in, in what we currently believe or, or who we are, then we're in trouble. We are undone and ruined in the presence of the Holy God, the Holy One, who has the ability to change the whole of the created order with just the word from his mouth. We fall apart before him. And if we do not realise that we are sinful and unworthy in his presence, then we have simply not come into his presence at all. This is not about choosing to know Jesus. You either think that he's merely the master and take his words as, you know, useful advice, or you know that he is the Lord and you shrink away from his holiness and perfection. But we, of course, have one distinct and crucial advantage that Simon Peter did not have at the time that this passage occurs. He knew that he was in the immediate presence of the Holy God and he shrank from Jesus. Simon Peter could at best only look forward to Jesus Christ making a way for him as a sinner to be reconciled unto a holy God. We, friends, however, live after that way has been made clear. Simon Peter did not yet know that Christ would die at the cross to make him and all other sinners that would come to him all others that he would call, that he would make them cleansed from their sins and pure in the Father's sight so that they can now stand before the mighty and holy God. So we now have an advantage that Simon Peter did not have at the time of the great catch of fish. We are right to tremble and quail in the presence of the mighty and perfectly holy Lord Jesus Christ but we also know the way he has made by sacrificing himself at the cross to cleanse us from sin so that we can now commune with him, so that we can now embrace him, as it were, instead of pleading that he depart. And if you are a Christian here this morning, brother or sister, then there is a poignant question for you in all this too. If you know Jesus Christ as is the Lord and that he is your Lord, then how has that changed you? You see, there was a change in Simon Peter when he came to realise the nature of the man who stood before him. When he realised that Jesus was not merely the master, but was the Lord and he became aware of his own sinfulness and the majesty and, and the holiness of Jesus Christ. Is that the way your mind comprehends all this? Or is your experience of Jesus more tame and conducted by your own rules? Or do you instead have that blessed idea of just how perfect and powerful the Lord Jesus Christ is? And does your Christian life follow that understanding? I'm not calling on anyone to be a radical here in the sense that the world would say. But Simon Peter gave up everything to follow Jesus Christ at this point because he understood that Jesus was the Lord. Is that us, friends, or do we still maintain a foot in each camp? Do we do our Jesus thing on a Sunday morning but live the rest of our week relatively unaffected? Or do we, instead having apprehended the Lordship of Jesus Christ, find ourselves living accordingly? Are our thoughts and our affections and attitudes and words and behaviour all in line with the realisation that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Lord of sinners like you and me? Does the way to reconcile the Lord with sinful people which Jesus made by his death on the cross mean for us that we can now live lives which show that he is our Lord? You see, so many people who identify as Christians, and in many, many cases genuinely are Christians, make the error of seeing Jesus primarily as affirming who they are. They have a Jesus who loves them just as they are. And that that in itself is not, not a bad idea. But it is only a minor part of the real picture, isn't it? 
And the problem I'm identifying, friends, by way of application, is that our society today, it's all about affirming people. Affirming people. I feel affirmed, people say. Affirming people regardless for how wrong their beliefs and how sinful their behaviour and that the church can end up peddling that same misleading message of affirmation. Simon Peter did not find affirmation in Jesus as to who he was. Rather, his encounter with Jesus Christ turned his whole world upside down. His seeing Jesus Christ for who he really is, the Lord, led him not to affirmation, but to being undone and pricked to his conscience about his own sinfulness. But just like us, Simon Peter found that although his own rottenness was exposed, that he found not rejection by Jesus, but acceptance, didn't he? He called him to follow him. And that's something we're going to look at in more detail in the next sermon, Lord willing. But the acceptance Simon Peter found with Jesus was not affirmation in our society's appreciation of the idea. The acceptance Simon Peter found with Jesus Christ was with Jesus calling the shots for Peter's life from that moment forward. You see, Jesus has, in our travels with him through Luke's account so far, shown himself to be Lord of disease, Lord of evil spirits, Lord of death and of life, and now Lord, in chapter 5, of the natural elements. And the upshot for us is the same as it was for Simon Peter, that Jesus is Lord of our lives too. All right, that Jesus is Lord of our lives too. And that means that if he is Lord and thus is our Lord, that whatever is in our lives which runs contrary to his rule needs to be thrown out. The romantic relationships or inclinations which are contrary to the rule of Jesus the Lord are not to be affirmed because it fits with the world's ideas of acceptance, but instead are to be thrown out as we come under the rule of Jesus the Lord. The sinful habits and the cherished pet sins which we nurse, which are contrary to the rule of Jesus as the Lord, are not to be affirmed because they fit with what the world likes, but instead are to be thrown out as we come under the rule of Jesus as Lord. The worldly ambition and greed and materialism, which are contrary to the rule of Jesus the Lord, Again, and not to be affirmed because they fit with the world's ideas of acceptance, but again are instead to be thrown out as we come under the rule of Jesus our Lord. So as we finish, friends, let each of us who know Jesus Christ make sure that we keep not the world's image and idea of him in our minds, but the picture of him presented in the scriptures, in the Bible, especially what we learn here in Luke chapter 5. Let us have him as our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for what we've read and considered here from Luke's account. And Lord, we pray that every one of us, man, woman, boy or girl, who hears this, would also find ourselves encountering Jesus no longer merely as the Master, but Jesus as the Lord. Jesus as the Lord of all, but particularly, Lord, that he would be Jesus who is Lord of our lives. And we pray it for his name's sake. Amen.